Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. Today's presentation is all about Ethernet IP and add-on instructions. My name is Eric Rice, and I'll be your moderator for the next 30 minutes or so. A quick note about this webinar series. This webinar is part of a series that started back in April and continues through next month, with new topics being presented roughly two or three times per week, uh, sorry, per month, and always on a Thursday. The presentations being made in these webinars, they cover a variety of topics related to motion control and always with our motor and drive products in the spotlight. All of the webinars in the series are being recorded and made available for watching on demand. Recordings usually go up within a day or two of the live event. You can find the recordings along with a schedule of upcoming webinar dates on our website. There's a link right on the homepage and in the news section. You can also find them on our YouTube channel. There's a, even a playlist there called webinars where you'll find all of these recordings as well as past webinars that are not part of this series. Regarding questions for today's presentation, there will be time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. Please submit your questions using the webinar control panel. Any questions we don't get to during the Q&A will be followed up via email afterwards. <clears throat> so without further ado, let me introduce today's presenter. Mike Maroney has 15 years of experience in the motion control and medical device industries, including a total of eight years of experience at Applied Motion Products. He's held various roles within Applied Motion, initially as a design engineer, where he focused his efforts on our first field bus and integrated motor solutions, then as our head of application engineering department, where he led our team of engineers in solving all kinds of challenging motion control applications brought to us by our customers. Most recently, Mike was promoted to a key role in our product management group, where he oversees many facets of product development, including market analysis, product roadmaps, development schedules, and a lot more. Mike holds a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And with that, I'll turn everything over to Mike for the presentation. Mike, it's all yours. Thanks, Eric, and thanks to everyone for tuning in to today's webinar. As Eric said, today I'll be talking about Ethernet IP and specifically Applied Motion's implementation of Ethernet IP. And I'll give you an overview of the AOIs and some other resources we have available to you and hopefully answer some of your questions at the end. We've got Ethernet IP solutions across our product line, you know, open and closed loop steppers, servos, integrated and standalone systems. Um, really, any of our products with an Ethernet port can run on Ethernet IP networks. This is you know, definitely one of my favorite topics. It's really satisfying to help people get their systems up and running and to see what people are producing with our motors. But as field buses have evolved over the years, system complexity has really shot through the roof. And we're seeing that a lot of our customers are turning to us for support, not only to select the right motor and drive and how to hook up you know, their step and direction pulse train, but also for complex field bus and system integration challenges. This stuff is not always intuitive, and we at Applied Motion are committed to getting you up and running successfully. Now, I know you're all here for the AOIs, but before we get into that, I think it's worth taking a few minutes to talk about Ethernet IP in general. So first, let's do a quick recap of what Ethernet IP actually is, and then how Applied Motion implements it, and then we'll be ready to talk about AOIs. So Ethernet IP is an industrial Ethernet field bus. Without getting into too much historical detail, it's an evolution of the serial field bus device net, and it implements SIP messaging on Ethernet hardware. It has strong historical ties to Allen Bradley. However, the standards and certifications are actually managed by an industry group known as the ODVA. Our implementation is certified by the ODVA, which gives you the confidence that our products will run on Ethernet IP networks trouble-free. There's about a thousand videos on YouTube if you wanna dive into the technical details of SIP messaging and network configuration. I'm not planning on talking about any of that today, although if you have a specific question, you know, by all means, send it over in the questions panel and I'll either address it in the Q&A or else we'll follow up by email as Eric says. So for today, I'm gonna to assume that you have an Ethernet IP network already and that you wanna know how to implement an applied motion drive on that network. The default assumption with Ethernet IP, at least here in the US, is that you're gonna be running Rockwell Allen Bradley. So this is gonna be some combination of, you know, Studio 5000 or RS Logics on the software side 
and either compact logics or control logics on the hardware side. There are absolutely other hardware options out there. Omron, Panasonic, other PLC manufacturers support the seal bus in some way. And then of course, Codasys runs on a number of different platforms up to and including embedded PCs. So with all that in mind, all of the specific environmental examples I'm gonna to use today are gonna to be on Studio 5000 and Compact Logics, but we're by no means locked into that platform. You know, we've got other customers using Ethernet IP on non-Rockwell hardware, so this is something we can do for sure, it's just not the default. Reach out to myself and our support team and we'll get you up and running on whatever you're using. Before we really get going, I wanna be sure that we're on the same page with a little bit of Ethernet IP terminology. So explicit messaging, these are single messages used for setting and requesting drive parameters and registers asynchronously. So if you have a specific register value you're looking for, you can send an explicit message to the drive saying, hey, give me this value, and the drive will send one right back to you um, with the response. And then the other side of that is implicit messaging. So these are predefined registers and communication channels for communicating frequently used data to and from the drive. And then within implicit messaging, there's three terms we need to be aware of. Input assembly, these are the registers that are sent from the drive to the PLC. The output assembly are the registers that are sent to the drive from the PLC. And the RPI, this is the defined cycle time for that implicit messaging. So the RPI defines how quickly the input assembly and output assembly go back and forth between the drive and the PLC. And then finally, the EDS. This is an electronic data sheet, which is loaded into your PLC, or more specifically loaded into your, um, into the software, Studio 5000. And it identifies the drive model number, the input assembly, the output assembly, and all the other communication details um, that the drive supports. So the PLC knows what it's working with. If you want the details about Applied Motions implementation, check out the host command reference. This is your one-stop shop for all things Ethernet IP. We define what bits do what, what commands are available, we provide some examples. The AOIs we'll get into in a few minutes are all abstractions of this information. So between the specs laid out in the HCR and poking around inside the AOI code, you can get a complete picture of what we can do with the Ethernet IP and how to do it. And again, I know the focus here is on the AOIs, but understanding the background is critical to success and um, debugging problems as well. So here's a broad overview of the communication types that we offer and support on our Ethernet IP implementation. So explicit messaging, again, you can think of this as register reads and writes. We support type one and type two explicit messages, which are roughly equivalent to buffered and immediate SCL commands. I'm not gonna get into too much detail here since implicit is gonna fully cover about 99% of applications in terms of getting the motor to do what you want it to do. Suffice to say, you'll probably only use explicit messaging if your PLC doesn't support implicit messaging. You know, Micro 800 is a great example of that. Or if you need to read back a specific register value that's not communicated via explicit, implicit messaging, you could also use that. For example, if you want to do server tuning over Ethernet IP. These are all what I would consider advanced applications. So if you have more questions on explicit messaging, I'm happy to take them offline. Implicit messaging and applied motions implementation in particular is really the thing that we're gonna focus on here. As I mentioned earlier, Applied Motion is ODDA conformant, which means that our products are fully certified to run on Ethernet IP networks without issues. The catch is, the ODVA doesn't specify how to control a drive, only that our networking is up to snuff and that the message types in this table behave nicely with the PLC and other devices on the network. So unlike CanOpen or CanOpen over Ethercat, which have a networking spec CIA 301, and an additional motion control spec of CIA 402, Ethernet IP leaves it up to the vendors to define how to implement motion functionality. So what we've mapped out with our implicit messaging is how to define that motion functionality and how to make it look and work as much like SCL as possible to make integration to your system easy. So let's take a look at some of these implicit register maps. We'll start with the assembly, uh, the input assembly instance 101. The variable names in that second column tell us what's going on here. The register block contains just about everything the PLC needs to know to make sure its orders are being followed and to make smart decisions for the system. 
So, you know, drive status, IO status, position velocity, et cetera, are all included here. And you can see that each of the 14 elements in the array is 32 bits long, which makes decoding in the PLC simple. This is the input assembly that our AOIs use, and it's the default chosen in our EDS files. And note that I refer to this as instance 101. That 101 is an address. We do have another input assembly, instance 100, but that's provided to ensure back compatibility for some of our legacy applications. So if you're designing something from scratch, 101 is what you want to be looking at and using. And now remember the input assembly comes from the drive and goes to the PLC, and it's refreshed on the RPI interval. That means if you set up the RPI to be 10 milliseconds, every 10 milliseconds, you'll get fresh info back from the drive. If you set the RPI to be 100 milliseconds, you'll get back that same info every 100 milliseconds. The RPI you choose is up to you, and you'll need to weigh you know, network congestion and the number of nodes on the network against the need for timely information from each axis. And axes can definitely have different RPIs as needed. You know, say you have a mission critical safety curtain um, on a network, on the same network as the drive, it might be important to have that information every couple of milliseconds, but maybe you really only need information from the drive every 100 milliseconds. That's totally fine. Now let's look at the other half of the input and message structure. The output assembly is information which is sent from the PLC to the drive. And even if you look at the element descriptions here, you can see that this is how you set up all of the variables for moves and SDL commands. Let's say we want to do a relative point-to-point -point move, which of course is the FL command in the SDL language. Here, we'll stuff elements four, five, six, and seven with the command parameters. These four things, velocity, acceleration, deceleration, and distance, are the four things you need to define in any point-to-point -point move. And now if we zoom in on element zero, which you can see is called the command word, we can see that this is how we actually kick off the move. The move can be started by a rising edge on the FL bit, which we can see here is bit number three. And so the sequence of events here is to make sure that element zero has been cleared for at least one RPI interval, to pull bit three high to create that rising edge, hold that high for at least one RPI interval, and then we can drop it back down and move on with the next command. So in the command word here, we've included bits for the most common commands, you know, different types of move, mode enable, disable, executing queue segments, et cetera. But that's not always enough. So bit 18 allows us to access a whole array of SCL commands, still with the ease of use of implicit messaging. This eye chart, which I don't expect you to be able to see and read, um, is from the host command reference. And it details each of the SCL commands that are supported in implicit messaging and how to use them. So to do a complex move, such as hard stop holding, as an example, you would need to send about a dozen of these SDL commands to set up all the different move parameters and speeds and currents and such before you finally kick it off by sending an HS command. And while implicit messaging is easier than explicit messaging, it's still quite, a, uh, quite an ask to do all that PLC programming and sequencing. And if you're lost right now, don't worry. That is exactly why we've created our AOIs. We want this to be as accessible and as easy to use as possible for both the programmers and the non-programmers alike. Okay, now that we have that background material out of the way, we can actually talk about the AOIs. Um, AOIs are pre-canned functions that you can import into Studio 5000 or RS Logix that abstract out the complexity of doing these common tasks. We've developed 20 AOIs to cover the most common use cases of our drives, including an AOI to send an SCL command, which further opens the door to execute complex sequences. These are released as App Note 46 on the support section of our website, AppliedMotion.com. We've written these AOIs to take advantage of our implicit messaging channel wherever possible, although some of the more advanced ones do use explicit in the background. Um, these are designed with and for Allen Bradley PLCs, They'll work with RS Logix version 20 and up, any of the Studio 5000s, and any of the Compact Logix or Control Logix PLCs. So like I've said before, we can and do work with other platforms. So if this does not describe your setup, reach out and we'll work with you. Um, but for the vast majority of our customers, uh, you're going to have some sort of Compact Logix or Control Logix setup, and these are for you. I've got a series of videos up on our YouTube channel on this subject, and the first one 
deals with the mechanics of getting the EDS file imported, the AOIs imported, the communication established. So if you're having a hard time getting past step one and actually talking to the drive, please check out that video. What I'm gonna to do today is go into a little more of the theory behind the AOIs and not worry so much about the implementation details since those videos are already out there to cover that. At a very high level, you can think of AOIs as functions. These are pre-written blocks of code that have some specific purpose in life, abstracting out all the minutia of executing a repetitive task and freeing up the system designer, you know, you, to focus on program flow rather than communication details. So you simply drop the AOI onto the ladder, you point it to the input and output assemblies, you fill in some tags, and you can kick it off with a single bit transition. The AOI then walks through a state machine that deals with converting the variables into the correct units, managing the input and output assembly communications, and making the task actually happen. And it's important to know too, these are distributed completely open and unlocked. That means once you drop them into your program, you can open them up to view and modify the source code as needed. Broadly speaking, our 20 AOIs are divided into three categories, drive feedback and control, motion, and configuration. In that first category, we have all the information coming back on our implicit input assembly, easily readable and pre-mapped into tags for use elsewhere in your code. We also have the ability to execute queue segments, send SDL commands, and do other non-motion specific tasks like enable and disable the motor. In the motion category, we've included the ability to kick off many different simple and complex move types using a single bit trigger. And finally, in the configuration category, we've included the ability to change a lot of different motor parameters, including the ability to send over new tuning parameters for our closed loop products. So I definitely consider this configuration group the advanced category. And if you find yourself thinking about using these, give us a call for some best practice recommendations. Generally, these are only used when for some reason it's undesirable to use the applied motion configuration software and you need your PLC to download the configuration settings instead. That's all I'm gonna say about the configuration AOIs today, but as before, please reach out with your specific questions and I'll be happy to help out. So when I was first going through, um, you know, the, the beginning part of the presentation, it's likely you were thinking one of two things. Either, number one, this is so basic, why spend time on it? And if so, you're probably a PLC programmer. And number two, what the heck is this guy talking about? And the fact it's you, you're probably on the motion engineering side of things, not a full-time programmer. Either way, these AOIs are for you. These are designed to be both powerful and simple, allowing you to either drop them in and use them without a second thought, or import them, inspect the code, and modify it to fit exactly what you need. So with that said, Let's dive into a couple and see how they work and how to read the associated support documentation in AppNote 46. We'll start with an easy one, the status code AOI. So within AppNote 46, you'll see a detailed entry for each AOI, like this one for status code. This will include an overview of the AOI functionality, including any relevant SCL commands it implements, an image of the AOI that's gonna look dropped onto your ladder, a detailed description of the functionality, and a table outlining all the inputs and outputs for the AOI. So for status code, it's pretty simple, right? It reads the status code and it reports it back out. Now here's what the same AOI is gonna look like in your program. If you'll recall, the status code is element zero of the input assembly. And this means that every RPI cycle, we get a fresh status code back from the drive. Now when it comes back from the drive, it's hidden away in a data array. But what our status code does is take that data array and map each bit over into an intuitively named tag that can be referenced elsewhere in your program. So over on the left there is the AOI that looks dropped onto your ladder, and you can see that it's pointed toward the status code field in the input assembly data array. And on the right is what the AOI looks like behind the scenes. And I know it's too small to actually read here, but you can see that it's simply a one-to-one -one map where we decode the bits in the status code on the left and assign them to named Boolean tags on the right. Simple, easy, completely transparent, once you point to the input assembly. And you'll notice on the left that the in position bit is lit up green. And on the right, you can see that's because the fourth bit down in the status code from the input assembly is also green. So what this allows you to do, for example, is kick off a move, then monitor the named bit moving to make sure it's happening, and also to verify it's done with the in position bit. And the AOIs also do this themselves behind the scenes, uh, which we'll get into in a few minutes.
So the next one I want to look at is a little bit more complex. In order to execute an absolute move, we need to set up a few drive parameters, right? Target position, move speed, Axel, and decel. These are the bottom four tags in the ALI there. And the ALI has conveniently allowed us to enter them in the same units as you're used to for SCL commands, namely revs per second and revs per second squared. And that's outlined in app note 46, the units that each of these variables use. There's also some housekeeping tags up on the top. We need to point the AOI to the input and output assemblies and provide the AOI, I'm sorry, provide the RPI so the AOI knows how long to hold the output assembly for each command. And finally, we provide a start bit, which is how you, the user, trigger the AOI to move once you set the other tags as needed. So once the start bit is pulled, we go into the AOI and we can see there's some math that happens to scale the variables correctly, some state stuff the output assembly with the scaled variables, and finally some logic that sets and holds the output assembly for the correct amount of time, along with a little bit of error checking. Now again, obviously I don't expect you to read that whole thing on the screen here, um, but you can see how quickly a somewhat simple move, an FP, can really blow up your code. And in this case, it takes 13 lungs of ladder to set up, send, and verify the FP. And we've abstracted that all out into a single start bit trigger. Now let's look at a really complex one. Hard stop homing is an incredibly powerful feature of our closed loop products, which allows you to find a home position by carefully running the motor to a stall condition against a hard mechanical limit. There are three move segments that are possible in hard stop homing. Each one has an acceleration and deceleration of velocity, along with options for offset distances, running current, and making use of the encoder index pulse if desired. So scaling the variables, setting them to the drive, monitoring the move requires 36 rungs of ladder logic. The complete code is just way too small to see anything useful on the slide. So you can see I zoomed in on a couple of rungs with cutouts there on the right. I've got a whole video on setting up and using this AOI. So I really just wanted to highlight it here to say, even though it's a complex command, it still works just like all the others. You stuff the variable, you pull the start bit high, and you're off and homing. It probably goes without saying, but stopping motion is important in motion control. Perhaps you're jogging, you need the PLC to issue a stop command based on a sensor it's monitoring. Perhaps you're doing a point-to-point -point move and an interrupt event occurs that requires you to stop motion. All the motion AOIs set moves in motion, but they don't stop moves. Now, of course, the point-to-point -point move completes on its own, but if you need to interrupt it, you need an additional AOI. And that's where the normal stop and the crash stop AOIs come in. So pulling the stop bit high on either one is gonna stop the motor. Now, please note that neither one of these requires the user to set a deceleration value. In a first glance, that may be an odd choice. Um, however, the normal stop AOI uses whatever deceleration is defined by the move type. So point-to-point -point moves use the DE command, jog moves send over a jog decel value. For the crash stop, the E stop, it was a conscious decision to save one RPI cycle by not needing to send the max acceleration first. The max acceleration is usually configured with the applied motion configuration software, or you can send an AM SCL command through the send SCL AOI. But by not requiring this um, to be entered in the E stop AOI, it lets us save an RPI cycle and then stop that much faster. So now we have a basic understanding of some of these AOIs. Let's talk about the specifics of getting them ready to use. And I wanna cover RPI first. RPI defines the communication speed between the drive and the PLC. It's a two-fold agreement that the drive makes with the PLC. Number one, to send a fresh input assembly every RPI cycle. And number two, to process one command per RPI cycle. And then the PLC in turn agrees that when it sends new commands, it will hold the output assembly constant for at least one RPI cycle to make sure the drive has time to process the commands it sends. So to satisfy this agreement, we need to tell the AOIs what the RPI is. So why don't we just ask the PLC programmatically? Well, it turns out different PLCs store this information in slightly different places. So asking the user is the cleanest way to make the AOIs work on the widest number of PLCs with the least amount of setup. And then once the AOI knows how long the RPI is, it can be sure to hold the output assembly for the right length of time. And in fact, most of our AOIs have a rung identical to the one right here. This rung sets some timer presets to 1.3 times the programmed RPI. These presets are used throughout the AOI as hold times for output assembly changes. And that 30% buffer we built in as a safety factor. As an example of why this is important, 
let's look at those bottom few bullet points. If your RPI is 100 milliseconds, but you tell the AOI it's actually only 25 milliseconds, the output assemblies are going to change every 32 and a half milliseconds. So the drive is expecting a change at most every 100 milliseconds. Um, so it's going to miss more commands than the processes in this case. Needless to say, it's going to cause some unexpected behavior. And next, I want to talk about the status bit output that the AOI provides. Sent simply means all the commands are sent to the drive. With a slow RPI, like 250 milliseconds, it's possible to actually see this bit toggle on and off if you're watching the PLC in remote run uh, during debug. With a faster RPI, like you know, 10 milliseconds, it's likely you won't even notice the flash. In progress is a trickier one because it depends on the type of AOI you're using. For a homing or a point-to-point -point move, the in-progress bit will stay on for the duration of the move. So if you have a long move, then the in-progress bit will be on for a while. When you're jogging, by contrast, as soon as the CJ command is sent, the AOI is done. So because you kick off a jog and then move on, the AOI considers the command done as soon as jogging commences. And if you're familiar with blocking SCL commands, that's exactly what's going on here. And then finally, we have the two end state bits, done and error. Done is just what it sounds like. All the commands are successfully sent over and finished processing. In a normal error-free progression, the in-progress and the done bits are inverted. That is, as soon as the in-progress turns off, done turns on. Error is a little more nuanced. Error is either an error in sending some command in the AOI over to the drive, or an error in the command execution itself. The most common reason I've seen for this occurring is a sequencing error in the PLC, where two AOIs are attempting to send commands at the same time, and then both end up in an error state. Note that this is looking for a specific status word bit, so the exact condition of done and error depend on these specific AOIs. So for example, if you send a relative move and the motor stalls during the move, you get the error bit set. You can then use the input assembly to see exactly what's going on and take some action from there. If you do plan on using done and error in meaningful ways in your code, I'd invite you to dig around the AOI code to understand exactly how each is set, and also see what we have to say about the done and error for your specific AOI in app number 46. Beyond AppNote 46 and the actual AOIs, there are a number of resources to help you get up and running. So the Ethernet IP implementation, as I mentioned, is outlined in our host command reference. You can find most of the screenshots of tables and commands I use today in that document. It contains all the information you need to talk to an Ethernet IP device from whatever host you're using. It doesn't have to be Rockwell. The EDS files are product specific and can be found on the product page for your particular drive on the Applied Motion website. And our newest resource is our Ethernet IP tutorial playlist, which can be found on our YouTube channel. These are generally 15 to 30 minute hands-on walkthroughs where I do some specific tasks so you can follow along. This is something I'm actively developing, so if you have other topics you'd like to see covered in detail, let me know in the questions box and I can get it on the list. And then finally, give our apps engineers a call. We keep them around to solve problems like this, so by all means, use them. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Eric for some questions. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Um, a number of questions have already come in, so let's start with those. As a reminder to everyone on the webinar, if you would like to submit a question, please go ahead and use the webinar control panel to type your question in, and we'll do our best to get it here in the last few minutes that we have for Q&A. So, Mike, the first question that came in is from Jeb. He says, which products offer hard stop homing? Closed loop products. So step servos and servos. Got it. Because you need to have an encoder, right? You need to have, you, yeah, but specifically a closed loop product. So an open loop step motor um, with an encoder is not going to have hard stop homing. You can still, you know, you can still kind of fake hard stop homing and you know, lower the running current, run the motor to the hard stop, detect the stall with the encoder and move on. But the neatly encapsulated hard stop homing command that manages that process for you is only available on the um, step servo and full servo products. But all of those Got products it. do support all step servos and servos. Okay, cool. Excellent. Uh, next question is from Jay. He asks, uh, it sounds like he's a user of our stuff uh, already. Are there any AOIs or other maybe YouTube materials that assist with speeding up the actual driver reset time 
after an e-stop power drop. He's saying he's seeing about five seconds or more. And I think this is when the, when the drive powers up before you can start communicating again with the PLC. Yeah, so that's got, that's got nothing to do with the ALIs, unfortunately. That's, um, let, let's, let's take that one offline. I want to follow up with exactly what the application is, and we can, we can talk about what might be going on there. Um, but I think we can work with that. Okay, cool. So, um, to Jay, we'll follow up with you via email. We can dive further into that. Um, thanks, Mike. Next question comes from Dan. How fast does the motor or drive update position in the PLC program? So that depends on the RPI that you choose. Um, remember, the input assembly is where you're going to see all the fresh information come back from the drive. I can let me go back to that slide real quick. Okay, so here's the input assembly. So all this information is going to come back from the drive every RPI cycle. So if you set your RPI to be 100 milliseconds, every 100 milliseconds, you're going to get all this information fresh back from the drive. If you set your RPI to be 10 milliseconds, every 10 milliseconds, you're going to get information fresh back from the drive. And I think probably the next logical question is, okay, well, how fast can it go? Um, that really depends on your network, you know, because depending on how many devices you have on the network, how fast each one of them is sending, you don't want to run into network congestion issues. But from the drive's point of view, you know, four or five milliseconds is, is pretty safe if you, need drive, if you need information that fast. Cool. Um, I don't know if there are tools in the Rockwell software that allow you to monitor traffic, um, like can open, but that might be helpful too if there is such a thing. Yeah, not that I've come across from Rockwell. Um, you know, Wireshark is my go-to for monitoring and trying to figure out Ethernet um, communication problems. And since Ethernet uh, IP yeah. runs on standard Ethernet hardware, Wireshark drops right in, and it can even decode Ethernet IP packets. So if you have an Ethernet problem or Ethernet IP problem, and you want to look at the bits going back and forth, I would highly recommend Wireshark. And um, so a lot of times, if customers are having issues, you know, some kind of a question about, well, this isn't working or maybe it's not working. The first thing we'll say is download Wireshark, get a trace, and, you know, let's start, let's start there debugging. It's a great tool. Good old Wireshark. <laughs> um, I think we got time for one more. And uh, this one comes from Dave. He asks, does it matter which order you drop the AOIs into your ladder? Um, maybe he's curious about, you know, I'm sure some, I would guess, Mike, some AOIs don't care too much about the order, but some maybe are more particular. No, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter at all, right? Because ladder is not like um, sequential programming. Everything happens all at the same time. Um, it it okay. doesn't matter at all as long as you're, you know, you, you manage whether the AOIs are going to start their move or not by toggling that start bit. And so the order in which you toggle the start bit is important in the program flow. But when I'm doing a PLC program, I'll usually just have, you know, one or two or three rungs. Really, the only difference is visibility, how I want to look at my program, that have the AOIs on them that are stuck off in the corner of my program somewhere. And then I'll put the start, I'll pull the start tags, the start bit down into tags and use those in my program flow. But where the AOIs physically are doesn't matter at all. Got it. Okay, awesome. Um, so in the interest of time, we're going to call it. Uh, I will, there could be one or two more questions here that we can follow up via email. Uh, thank you everybody for those questions. Um, a quick uh, request uh, for our survey. There will be a follow-up email sent to everyone with a short three-question survey about today's webinar. It takes at most a couple minutes to complete. Please take the time to uh, submit your feedback via that survey. We really do appreciate your feedback, and we really do take it to heart when planning and building these presentations. As a final reminder, the next webinar in this series is just one week from today. We've been on a two-week pace up till now, but two weeks from today is 4th of July, and so we'll be going uh, next week where we'll be presenting uh, some details about our integrated motors with power over ethernet so you may want to check that out thank you mike and thank you everyone for attending we greatly appreciate your interest 
in applied motion products and we hope you have an excellent rest of your day.